My name is P.C. Brian Greg, and uh, we have a special guest speaker for you tonight. Uh, poor Vogue, just for those of you who don't know about it, uh, is our group has a, a quest, and it's very simple. Our quest is to promote voting by the poor. And so I'd like to introduce for you now uh, Naomi Rankin, who is the leader of the Alberta Communist Party. I want to first say just thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, we're always glad to talk to people, and particularly a group like this. Um, so um, I'll try to be brief and you know, make lots of time for discussion. So I don't, like, I don't need to tell you about you know this is the rich, richest province in the world, and it's an incredible scandal that there should be poor people at all. I mean, the liberals can tell you that. And I don't need to tell you that it's a scandal that uh, with the low um, royalties and taxes that are paid by the multinational oil and gas corporations, frittering away the incredible wealth that could be used you know, to fund social services you know, to unheard of levels in a way that could eradicate poverty. I don't have to tell you that. The NDP can tell you that. And I don't have to tell you about the fact that there are impediments for poor people voting Right. Various social agencies can tell you about that. What I want to, I think we can all take it for granted that, you know, that we're all appalled at the existence of poverty in a wealthy society. What I want to talk about is something a little bit on a larger scale, like why don't people vote? And, you know, as opposed to the technical problems of things like not having an address to register or something like that. You know, we know that you know, the very poor, the homeless, will tend to not vote. I mean, obviously, they, they're engaged in a full-time struggle just for survival. But we also know that poor people who do have homes and who do have jobs, who are poor not because they you know, have no life skills or, or because of a mental illness or drug addiction, but because they're just not paid a living wage for the work they do, those people tend to not vote much either. And, you know, so it, there's a continuum. It's not just the desperately poor who don't vote. So why don't the, oh, the marginally less poor people vote, who do have homes and addresses that they can register to vote from? And I think there is a similar reason, is that they, they have the idea that they are marginalized, that they do not own and control anything and the reason that they have this feeling is because it's true. They are marginalized. They do not own and control. That if people have, if people have real ownership and real control, you know, a sense of real belonging and real agency in their society, they will vote. We wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to convince them. We wouldn't have to go to a lot of trouble to work around the impediments. It would just, obviously they would vote. Why would you not vote? So I think the, the, the bigger problem, the more fundamental problem is why do people feel that their society doesn't really belong to them? And as I said, the answer is because it's true. Their society doesn't belong to them. In a, in a capitalist, capitalist society, essentially the ownership and the control rest with a very small minority who own really substantial holdings. I mean, I'm not, not even talking about, you know, shopkeepers or you know, small businesses or even medium-sized businesses. The, the real control rests with an, an incredibly tiny minority of extremely wealthy people. And in, in our global society, those people might very well not reside in Alberta at all. Right? The, the, particularly in a resource-based economy uh, like ours where there's so much foreign control. The, the real ownership and control doesn't even reside within the province. So, what would it be, what would, it, what would we need in order for people to really feel that they have some control, that, they, that it's worth their while to vote? Well, we'd have to break down that pattern of that you know, incredibly narrow and uh, une, unequal private ownership. In other words, we need socialism. 
you know, socialism isn't about everybody gets the same pay or everybody lives in the same size house. It's about the fact that the real wealth and power in society are collectively owned, are publicly owned, and therefore are controlled by the agencies of the public, the government or you know, workers' committees, or you know, th there can be different forms of it. But essentially, it's where the ownership and the control rest with the people who create the wealth, the great majority of people who are workers. And that they could be um, teachers, they could be store clerks, they could be plumbers, they could be bottle pickers. In that sense, we're all equally disenfranchised, we're equally, as members of the working class, we don't have that ownership, we don't have that control. And so what would it be like you know, to actually live in a society where you do have control, where you're one of the, the people who owns the place and runs the place? Well, I don't know. None of us know. We've never experienced that. We've never lived in a society where just everybody, all of us, the people we work with, our neighbors, where we run the show. But we do know that it would be different from the situation we have now. We do know that if we did run the show, we would have different priorities from the uh, multinational corporations. We'd put the environment before profit. We'd put public services before profit. We'd set a priority on education for everyone and healthcare for everyone and a meaningful job for everyone and support to those who need support if they have special issues of health or education or life skills that there would be the supports in place to bring so that everybody becomes one of the owners. And then the question of who votes and who doesn't vote really is a totally different question. So from the point of view of the Communist Party, Voting is only one symptom of a, a greater malaise in society, of that, that uh, absence of, of control and power to the great majority of people. And so our solution is the biggest possible solution, is change the system, change the ownership and control, have a socialist society, and then Everybody is one of the owners, everybody is one of the controllers, and everybody is one of the voters. So, we do have you know, policies for what happens in the meantime. You know, we don't actually think that this is all going to occur tomorrow. It's, it, it, it'd be a long and complex struggle to, to raise this kind of a political program, to win support for it from the great majority of working people and to actually implement it. So, in the meantime, I say all power to organizations like, like this one, you know, who, who will attempt to address these problems right now and do what can be done right now. And we support that. We're not in favor of, letting, of you know, throwing people off the edge of the lifeboat. In the meantime, you know, between now and when we can implement a bigger and a broader solution. But we don't want to lose sight either of that bigger and broader um, idea of, of what kind of society we could have. <coughs> Where the idea of poverty and the idea of homelessness and the idea of marginalization simply disappear. So that's what I have to say. I hope that uh, you'll uh, tell me what you think. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Naomi? everything, what, what gives motivation to the people 
to actually excel at their jobs, to enjoy their jobs, to be proud that they're doing their job. It's just a question that I have about the Communist Party in general. I, I totally agree that the, that the poor should have the right to vote. I think it's important. Um, I myself don't have not voted in the past because of the reason of being not educated enough to know who to vote for, not because I don't have enough money or enough motivation, but it's, it's a lack of understanding and a lack of time to have that understanding. But in, in the communist party way, how does how do you how do you get those people motivated to even care? It's a good question. In fact, it, it is the question. Right? And like if I actually had a magic formula to motivate people, I would have used that magic formula long ago, right? And we'd be further ahead. But it is that is a difficult question. Because it isn't a it isn't a technical problem of you know the, the sort of the, the resources that are available to society, or the machinery that's available. It's a problem of people's ideology and people's attitudes. Like what we have to fight for is our ideology. And I, I don't, I'm not using ideology in the sense of you know, fake ideas, but like a real view of the world where the, the people will want to embrace that responsibility of being in charge. And, um, well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say that they did everything right in the Soviet Union, because if they had, they'd still be in power. Right? They wouldn't have lost power uh, if, you know, they, they, they lost the, the support of the people. So, uh, but we can learn something from that. And one of the things is how important it is that the actual engagement of running the society is more decentralized. We actually now, in, in Canada, we have a situation which is actually gives, a, you know, gives us a better basis to move towards that. In the Soviet Union, I mean, just historically, they were, you know, it was a very small working class, like an urban working class, with a very large peasantry, enormous numbers of whom were illiterate. When they talked about raising the cultural level of the peasants, they meant things like teaching them to use toilets, I mean, it was a very backward country, and it fell upon a very small group to, you know, to sort of take charge of people who had you know, some education, some technical skills. That's not the case in Canada, right? We have, uh, you know, capitalism has gone on. I mean, um, technological development has, has gone on. It requires a level of education in the working class just to be able to, to do the jobs that capitalism needs from us, they are forced to, to raise the educational level of, of working people. So we have a lot more skills, a lot more widely dispersed than they ever did in, in Russia in 1917. Right? We're, we're, we'd be in a position to also to engage many, many more people in the running of, of a new society from the very beginning. When you give people ownership of the job, they really sign on for it. Like, you don't have to import motivation from somewhere else. The motivation is intrinsic if it's really your job, really your responsibility, if you care about the work that you're doing. It's not just something that's imposed on you. You know, like, you must scrub this floor, but no, you must run this hospital. Okay? Those, it's intrinsically motivating if people have the real power and the real control to do it. It's still going to be difficult to get from here to there, to be in a position to start the process of, of taking on those jobs. I, but I, I think that, as I say, the motivation is intrinsic. People want to do important things. So now you just mentioned the, the failure of the, of, the, of the big government bureaucracy driven thing in, in the Soviet Union. So, is, is the Alberta Communist Party, what, what is the Alberta Communist Party's vision of the way a, 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 a communist economy and social order would work? Uh, you, you mentioned um, things like uh, uh, local level, things like maybe workers' cooperatives or whatever. Can, can you expand on that? Well, I don't have a detailed 
blueprint. But fortunately, I don't need one because there's a whole working class of millions of people with a lot of energy and a lot of ideas and a lot of experience and a lot of expertise in many different areas. But I think what we have to think about you know, as a political party, the Communist Party, is how can we contribute to the development of a political movement that's going to actually raise the issue, put the issue of socialism you know, out there where it really is on the agenda for people. And when we do that, you know, when somebody does that, it doesn't have to be only the Communist Party. You know, we don't claim exclusive ownership or exclusive power. If you get people actually signed on to the idea of socialism, then we have all, the, all that knowledge, all that experience, you know, all, all the inventiveness and creativity of the millions of people. Other people will fill in the blanks of all the details about how to run things. I could say just as a, you know, just as a, just a very general principle, there's some things that we know would, would have to be part of, of a socialist system. And one is the collective ownership and control. And that the most important collective ownership is of the most important aspects, the most productive parts of the economy. So that it wouldn't matter, you know, if, like, there, there's somebody who runs a, a, a yarn store for knitters. I'm a knitter, I know about this. You know, we don't have to nationalize the knitting, the yarn store. But we do have to nationalize the tar sands and the banks. So, that, you know, we can state some very general principles. That it, it's, it needs to be the most important parts of the economy that are most uh, definitely publicly controlled collectively controlled, for the interests of the public as a whole, not for profit. But other than that, most of the details can, will be filled in as we go along. People will come up with ideas. China has been a communist country for somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 years now. And their working class, the conditions of their working class are deplorable when compared to Canada or Western European countries. How do you explain that? Well, a couple of things. One is that they did start out behind. I mean, with the beginning of the revolution in China, they were in, in fact in even worse condition than the, the condition of the Russians in 1917. I mean, it was an extremely poor country. Uh, it was overwhelmingly a peasant country. You know, there was a, a, an underdeveloped industry. It had been under the control of, what industry there was had been under the control of, of uh, imperial, you know, European powers. And so, they really started from zero. And um, the, the, the fact that there were, you know, there were certain policies, of, you know, what I generally call Maoist, that deflected from the, the level of, from the sort of path of development that might have um, improved their standard of living, you know, the most and the fastest, you know, didn't help. Um, they, in, in fact, have, it, it's an open question, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of debate whether, is it, uh, is it a capitalist country now? Or, are, you know, is, is it really still like, the working class in control and managing the, you know, the behavior of the capitalists for their own benefits? Hard to say. I don't think to, you know, to have a, uh, like a, but if, um, if, view into the future. I'm not sure how that's going to turn out. If you say that, for example, in your model, mm -hmm. that the working class people would be sharing in the ownership and sharing in the decision making mm -hmm. within the country, well, at some point in China's communist history, these people were given that opportunity. And it sounds like they chose to give it away. What would stop us from doing that in Canada? Nothing. People can always make mistakes. Like, but there's no guarantees. But so, once, once, once people are, you know, when, if people have real power, <laughs> real responsibility, well, they're going to have to exercise their real judgment to use it. It's it, like we we are um, sometimes accused of having a kind of a mechanistic view of history, like. You know, we're going to march on to socialism inevitably. It's just this sort of machine that's running independently of people's wills. That's not true. 
Right. We're going to march on to socialism when people take up the idea and decide to do it. And if they make mistakes, then you know they're going to have to fix those mistakes. It's not automatic. It, it's something that people, in fact, have to do. When, when, when working people decide that they're going to be the ones who make history. So if you make a mistake, it can, it can be a problem. But if you don't try, then you have the system that we have now. You know, with like, poverty, marginalization, racism, war, unemployment, environmental you know, degradation, like a real time bomb ticking down there. So but we don't have the option to not try to do better. Does anybody else have uh, questions for, for Naomi? Okay, well then, uh, uh, like you move to this meeting, be closed formally, and we'll have uh, uh, informal discussions amongst ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.